Steve Adams, my husband, was actually from Massachusetts. And um, when he moved in with me, before we got married, he came down to New York and he was, he, he, he hated New York. He hated everything about it. And so he, ev eventually it split us up. And he came back three years later. I'd had a wonderful affair with a jazz pianist. That was great. <laughs> and that broke up and he came back and he got a job at Windows on the World. And he was ecstatic. And it's the first time I've seen Steve truly happy about what he was doing for a living. So that day, he had just been promoted to beverage manager. He wanted to be a sommelier. He wanted, he was working with um, Dick Zarelli. David Zarelli? Uh oh. Kevin, Kevin Zarelli. And he was, he couldn't wait to just be, get to work. And he went in a half an hour early to, because he was training and he was trying to figure out this new computer program and so he was he was beside himself with joy and he which I'd never seen him be about a, a job and he he got up so early that uh, all I heard was I left my laundry in the living room and he was gone he that was it that's the last thing he said to me <laughs> and so there was this basket of laundry in the living room mind you that when he was unemployed Steve always did my laundry I want every you should know that, that not only did he do my laundry when I was working and he was unemployed, but he even knew to hang up the clothes that don't go in the dryer, and he did. He's a great guy. So anyway, so the phone rang. I'm, I fell back asleep, and the phone rings, and it's Steve's cousin, Steve, also a Steve, Steve Thompson. Did Steve go to work? I go, uh, yeah. Turn on the TV. His mother's hysterical. Uh, What's going on? A plane flew into the building, you know? I go, okay, okay, I'll call you back. I, I into the living room, turn on the TV, see what's happening, immediately call Steve's cell phone. No answer. The next person I call is my brother, who lives four blocks away. I, he, you know, he knew. I go, what do we do? You know, I'm coming over. So my brother comes over. And, you know, we spend the next 45 minutes in a state of shock. And, and then the building fell down. And then, and so that was that. I knew. He was in the North Tower. You know, and then the phone started ringing. I don't think my phone stopped ringing for about three months. <laughs> That's what it seemed like to me. I don't know if it was really that long. I, Steve had more friends. It, were, it was more, you know, it was all his friends. I mean, my friends were calling too, but it was more his friends. When we got married, there were 250 people at our wedding in, the, in my brother's backyard. It was ridiculous. He has this world, this country dance, English country dance world, and Morris dancing world, which is, you'll have to just Google Morris dancing, and you'll, M-O-R-R-I-S. People always think I'm saying Mars dancing, and they are Morris dancing. Anyway, that was how we met, Morris dancing. So we... You know, friends came over, people sat with me. My, my mom came, Steve's brother, oh, well, the, the best thing was Steve's best friend who lived in California at the time came as soon as he could get a flight. And then we went down to the pier and did all that stuff. But I, I always, I knew from the minute I s turned on the TV, I think I knew he was gone and I, I, to this day, I, 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 do, I do anguish about what, what, what happened to him. You know, what did he suffer? And I'm fearful that he did really suffer. Because they were on the top floor, and I'm sure it was either smoke inhalation or he died in the collapse. Because there was some communi communication with people that were in windows. There was a... a breakfast conference and some people had were able to communicate with whoever they knew and Steve's body was found and um, that to me means that he 
was he, I, mean, I talked to his best friend about it, who is this guy who works for FEMA now, and he said, you know, knowing Stevie was hanging on some beam trying to keep himself alive so he could try to, try to make it. And I think I just walked around New York City. I mean, everybody walked around New York City in a state of shock. You know, you saw people on the train just looking. And I was just, I would just cry. And nobody thought that was weird, you know, that, I mean, people sometimes would talk to me or, or not, but we were like one family on the train, on the subway, the, a place of strangers, you know, where this, you felt a kind of communion. And that's the shame of what we did, what the government did, because that was our, that was our chance to, the whole world was listening to us, even France headlines, Paris headlines, you know, were in sync with us and in sympathy for us. And that was a chance to bring the world to a peaceful understanding and or at least a way of communicating. And, you know, if these guys are fanatics and crazy, you know, suicide bombers, if they're so nuts, then if the whole world was watching and the whole world was in agreement about how to deal with this, don't you think we could have stopped it? Instead of bombing Afghanistan and killing innocent people and just creating more hatred. And I mean, how many people in the Middle East hate us? And it was an opportunity for the opposite of that.